Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, reveling in looser restrictions and the push to pick up stragglers. We're all ready to be out there. As Canadians celebrate newfound freedoms, provinces aim to get those last few people to roll up their sleeves. Three $1 million prizes. And the need for speed as the Delta variant spreads. It will find unvaccinated people. Also tonight, a small Saskatchewan town mourns a young RCMP officer killed in the line of duty. We hear from his family. The hot topic of vaccine passports. It was used as an incentive and it worked. I do see it as a slippery slope. As cities, countries, even rock concerts bring in rules requiring proof of vaccination, we dive into the debate. And it's been 10 years since Vancouver's second Stanley Cup riot and this magic moment. I was upset and I fell down and didn't really know, you know, exactly what was happening. Where are they now? This is The National. And it's nice to start with some good COVID news on this Sunday night as the number of cases in Canada continue to drop and more places across the country open up. From patio dining and indoor shopping in Ontario to indoor workouts in Calgary and more changes are on the way. But the Delta variant is still out there, perhaps the most transmissible version of the virus yet. Experts predict it will become the dominant strain in Ontario. And Tally Ricci shows us across the country it will take more than just falling infection numbers to keep reopening plans on track. Swimming, sports and sipping beers on patios. It's all very summer 2019. This weekend, people in Ontario enjoyed outdoor dining and indoor shopping after months of lockdown. We're very happy to be open and hopefully we stay open this time. Most provinces have tied their reopening plans to vaccination rates. This week, people in B.C. will be able to sit in a movie theatre as they enter their second stage. And in Manitoba, it was only this weekend that up to five people could gather outdoors again. This one, I think, was the biggest one for me. Yeah, just seeing... Um somebody else besides the people that live in my house. <laughs> but New Brunswick still hasn't quite hit the vaccination target to move to the first phase of reopening. They're still just shy of a target officials hoped to meet a week ago. In Alberta, the incentive to get a shot is a shot at winning a prize. The Premier announced a lottery this weekend. Three $1 million prizes and a range of ex other exciting prizes. Ready? Yeah. There, 69% of people 12 and over have received at least one dose, almost at the 70% mark, which will trigger the next and final stage of reopening, where all restrictions are dropped by July. For us to actually achieve protection against Delta, we need 70%, probably 85% double shot. I think we need to open up, but with Delta, we need a little more time to get there. Here in Ontario, a few restrictions lifted earlier than expected this weekend. But the province has accelerated second dose eligibility for some residents in hotspots on Monday. Because in the background of reopening, are experts watching for a bump in cases of the Delta variant. It will find unvaccinated people. It will find under-vaccinated communities. Which means a safe return to normal may depend on overcoming vaccine hesitancy. So we need to be able to uh, reach out to people based on what their value system is, how, how getting the vaccine will be relevant uh, to them and for them to be able to return to normal life. And continue seeing their city streets like this. Full of life, lots of people, lots of traffic. It's a good feeling. A feeling many hope is here to stay. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. There are new details emerging tonight about the death in the line of duty of an RCMP officer in Saskatchewan. Constable Shelby Patton was struck by a vehicle during a traffic stop yesterday in a small town about an hour east of Regina. Brian Enius was there today and has more from a community and a family grieving. A memorial is growing outside the Indian Head RCMP detachment tonight. The flag at half mast. We're all one, one family. So, you know, it's not just Wolseley, it's not just Indian. It's the community as a whole is, you know, is, is in shock. It was 8 a.m. Saturday when Constable Shelby Patton of the Indian Head RCMP stopped a truck on this street in Wolseley, Saskatchewan. 
RCMP say the truck was stolen. In it, a man and a woman who say RCMP drove off, striking and killing Patton. Wolseley Mayor Gerald Hill says people in his small town are still in disbelief, but coming together. Our community will move forward. We want to be recognized, but certainly not for, for an event like this. RCMP say they arrested two suspects. Charges have not yet been laid and the investigation is ongoing. To create the ideal RCMP member, you would, you would clone Shelby Patton. Patton, just 26, joined the force six years ago. He worked in Ottawa briefly before coming to the Indian Head Detachment. His grandmother, Linda Patton, says the family is completely broken. She said her grandson loved his job with a passion and always put others first. Well, I would say he was he's one of the best. You know, like he, uh, he wouldn't harm anyone. You know, that's the type of person he was, and he would do anything for you. She said while it was always in the back of her mind that something could happen to her grandson, the family never thought it would. He is the first RCMP officer to be killed on duty in Saskatchewan since 2012. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe tweeted, Our grief is only matched by our tremendous gratitude to Constable Patton for his service. The Prime Minister's office says Justin Trudeau will be reaching out to Patton's family this week. Brian Enius, CBC News, Wolseley, Saskatchewan. The first in-person G7 summit since the pandemic began wrapped up in Great Britain today. In their final communique, leaders pledged urgent action on the global vaccination effort. I'm very pleased to announce that this weekend, leaders have pledged over 1 billion doses, either directly or through funding to COVAX. At the start of the summit, Canada pledged 100 million doses, but today announced that 87 million have already been paid for, with 13 million more doses to be donated out of its planned surplus supply. G7 leaders also promised to enact a plan to shorten response time to any future pandemic. COVID was not the only major challenge on the G7 agenda. As the wealthiest nations consider their place in a post-pandemic world, they set themselves against an increasingly aggressive China. Evan Dyer on how a country not at the summit dominated the conversation. Departing G7 leaders issued a communique long on ambition but short on details, promising nearly a billion new vaccines, action on climate change and a renewed commitment to defend democracy. I think we're in a contest, not with China per se, but a contest with autocrats, autocratic governments around the world. U.S. President Joe Biden has said he won't allow China to become the world's top power as long as it's a dictatorship. And I said, for an American president to, every, every, every president to be sustained or prime minister has to represent the values of their country. It's not good enough for us just to rest on our laurels and talk about uh, how important those values are. But not everyone seemed to be on the same page. And is the goal that as long as China is an authoritarian one-party state, that it not become the world's top power? Is that your goal? No, the goal of the G7 has always been uh, the success not just of our countries and our economies, but the success of the global economy. Just to see if I understood you correctly, so you wouldn't necessarily object to China becoming the dominant power in the world while it's still an authoritarian one-party state? I'm, I'm not going to decode layers of hypotheticals in there. I think it's important that we be promoting uh, the rules-based system, uh, the agreed-to international laws, uh, and the opportunity for uh, everyone around the world to fulfill their potential. At home, Conservatives have criticized Trudeau for not being tough enough on China, while Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor remain in a Chinese prison. The Prime Minister says there is a consensus among the G7 nations on opposing arbitrary detention. Trudeau has now moved on to Brussels, where tomorrow NATO members, including many of the same leaders, will be hoping they can present a more united front against Russia than they did against China. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Brussels. Joe Biden used his first G7 summit to repair ties frayed under Donald Trump's presidency and to declare the United States was moving from confrontation to collaboration. Katie Simpson looks at the renewed relationship and whether it will last. It's a welcome return to the predictable, a friendly, drama-free meeting between longtime allies. And it's exactly what the U.S. president wants after spending the G7 summit trying to rebuild relationships. 
I felt a genuine sense of enthusiasm that America was back at the table and fully, fully engaged. Joe Biden needs to convince other world leaders that Donald Trump's America First agenda was a blip and that the U.S. is prepared to resume its traditional role as leader of the free world. If body language is any indication, Biden's efforts appear appreciated. He and the French president warm to one another quickly. And I think it's great to have a the U.S. president part of the club and uh, very willing to, to, to cooperate. The British prime minister felt the same way. It's fantastic. It's a breath of fresh air. Uh, a lot of things they want to do together. German Chancellor Angela Merkel smiled during her chat with Biden. Compare that to this image from three years ago, when the G7 gathering in Quebec went completely off the rails. I can't help but think back to our G7 summit in Charlevoix uh, that was made famous from a tweet from an airplane. Trump had left the summit but became enraged, calling the prime minister weak and dishonest on Twitter after seeing Justin Trudeau criticize U.S. tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum. There were no outbursts from Air Force One today as Biden touched down in Brussels for the NATO summit. Relief there too. What I welcome is that we now have a U.S. president, President Biden, who is strongly committed to NATO. World leaders are now watching to ensure that Biden's actions match his words and that the U.S. will make continued commitments that support global cooperation. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Also at the G7, the Prime Minister was asked about a golf match involving two senior military leaders and the former chief of the defence staff, Jonathan Vance. Obviously, the two men in question uh, need to answer those questions for themselves, but I know uh, that the Minister of Defence is following up with the acting chief of staff on this issue. Vance was spotted golfing earlier this month in Ottawa with the current vice chief of defence staff, who has authority over the department investigating Vance and the head of the Royal Canadian Navy. Late tonight, Vice Admiral Craig Baines issued an apology for, quote, not understanding how such a public display of support sends the wrong signal. General Vance, now retired, is accused of inappropriate behavior with women he worked with. Vance denies all allegations against him. Today brought more public demonstrations of grief and solidarity in memory of the four Muslim family members killed one week ago tonight in London, Ontario. Most importantly, we need the commitment of every person of goodwill to take that small first step, to smile, extend a greeting, read about someone who is not like you. Vigils took place in three Ontario cities today, capping off a week of public memorials across the country. Last Sunday evening, four fountains of sweetness were taken away. On Saturday, a public funeral was held in London for 15-year-old Yomna Afzal, her mother, Medea Salman, her father, Salman Afzal, and her grandmother, Talat Afzal. There was a huge crowd at the funeral. And in Mississauga, a march, a symbol of just how many people are saddened at the killings, which police say were motivated by religious hate. But the people at those marches aren't the ones who need to be reached, as the government promises to lead a fight against Islamophobia. On Friday, MPs committed to holding a summit on fighting anti-Muslim hatred. Rafi Bujikanian looks at what the battle plan might look like. We can't only address it when it leads to a crime. A week after the deadly attack that took the lives of four members of this Muslim family in London, Ontario, the calls to action have not stopped. On Friday, Parliament responded. The House call on the federal government to convene an emergency national action summit on Islamophobia. Accordingly, the motion's carried something the community wanted. I want to call for an immediate action, a national action summit on Islamophobia, where leaders come together to take immediate action on dismantling both violent forms of Islamophobia and systemic Islamophobia. So what could that look like? After a deadly rampage through two New Zealand mosques in 2019 killed 51, a royal inquiry made dozens of recommendations, including creating a new national security agency and plans for the police to better identify and respond to hate crimes. This Canadian advocate says he wants the same level of commitment here. We cannot, we cannot allow the situation to keep going. 
just not accept. I can't keep meeting families. Canadians can't keep seeing coffins. Uh, this needs to change. It's not about my frustration or the Canadian Muslim community's frustration. This is about basic human decency. The federal government has already promised the bill to address online hate is on the way, and back in February it added some far-right groups to a terror list. Ottawa says it will gather more ideas at the summit. What our government is going to do is actually work in partnership with Muslim leadership, make sure it is led by community to ensure that the government is not only responding but proactive to the needs of the community. Ottawa is committing to holding the summit before the end of summer and says it will send out invitations to all levels of government as well. Rafi Bujikan, CBC News, Ottawa. Tomorrow, the accused in the killings will appear in court. Nathaniel Veltman faces four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Quebec says it will work with the federal government on a plan to help indigenous communities in the province search the sites of former residential schools. There will be a, a circle that will be built with different uh, members of uh, First Nations to consult us, to, to tell us what should be done and which way it should be done also. The province says it will create a new governmental role, a facilitator who will help Quebec First Nations and Inuit communities in whatever they may want to do to investigate former residential schools in the province, including cons consulting with their communities, uncovering documents, organizing commemoration ceremonies or conducting physical searches. As more communities begin that emotional and complex process of searching for unmarked graves, Experts are warning about companies without the right expertise who might see that as an opportunity. Karen Paul shows us what a group of academics are doing about it. Yeah, big property here. Long Plain Chief Dennis Meaches points out some of the land he wants to search for unmarked graves. Over here, these uh, uh, spruce trees, there are some you know, suspicion there might be. It's a process many Indigenous communities across the country are starting, ever since a B.C. First Nation reported the discovery of human remains at the Kamloops Residential School. Anthropologist Keisha Supernant and her colleagues have been deluged with questions on how to proceed. Some communities are prepared to move quickly, and we want to ensure that this information is available to them. So they've created resources with some of the answers. I'm here to talk about how we use remote sensing technologies to help locate unmarked graves. Supernat warns about those who might see the opportunity in the news. She's heard of communities being approached by companies offering to do surveys of their land. Most large you know, engineering companies or geophysical companies have likely never attempted to use this to find graves. That's not a surprise to companies already working with First Nations. So I've been getting calls about people asking me, hey, could I give them a weekend course on how to do GPR? Companies getting a hold of me that just purchased a piece of equipment last month and they want to go out and start gathering grave sites. There is momentum to start this work, especially with news Ottawa will distribute $27 million to help locate and identify children who never came home. We don't want um, kind of any misinformation told that could, that could cause any further pain or, or upset. It's not a uh, show up and, 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 and do them kind of job. Experts say it's important not to make rushed decisions and to support survivors throughout the process. They hope the search for unmarked graves will bring healing and not more pain. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. An Alberta man was looking to finalize his divorce, but instead he found himself out $1,100 and still married. It's just a license to steal in a way, I guess, yeah. Up next, our Go Public team looks at his case and the surprising gaps in regulating paralegals. Plus... Do we want to accelerate a return to normal? This is the way to do so, or one way to do so. Vaccine passports may be the price of a little more freedom, but not everyone is giving them a stamp of approval. And... We went on vacation to Florida. Las Vegas. The Maritimes. Hawaii. And New York City. All, all in, in our, our house. house. Who needs a vaccine passport when you've got your imagination? We're back after this.
terrifying scenes in central China after an explosion reduced much of a street to rubble. At least 12 people were killed. Dozens more were seriously injured. Rescuers rushing to pull survivors from the rubble. The blast centered on a commercial building. The cause is still under investigation. In Israel tonight, cheers and celebrations on the news of the tenure of Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's longest serving prime minister, has now officially ended. But Margaret Evans also finds doubt as well as concern that the era of bitter divisions over major issues is far from over. A dignified exit, it was not. Benjamin Netanyahu's allies expelled from the Knesset one after the other for bad behavior during the debate. The man himself insisting he won't be gone long. We'll be back soon. The incoming Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, is a particularly hard pill for many Netanyahu supporters to swallow. A former Netanyahu aide, he's seen as betraying his right-wing nationalist base by joining hands with Yair Lapid, the centrist politician behind an extremely broad coalition government including, for the first time, a Palestinian Arab-Israeli party. They have little in common, says analyst Gail Talshir, beyond their desire to usher Netanyahu out after 12 years in power. It's not just Netanyahu the person, but the kind of politics that uh, Netanyahu brought uh, with the, uh, the incitement and the hate speech and uh, the uh, dividing rule between the different uh, groups and sectors in uh, Israeli society. Israel has seen four elections over the past two years, a reflection of a society not just divided, but fractured into many parts. I don't know somebody better than Netanyahu. You know, anyone will be better than this corrupted man there that destroy Israel for pieces. Israelis say political stalemate has meant many issues have simply been ignored like transportation, health, education. But some issues, including the elephant in the room, the Israeli occupation, are to be avoided, according to coalition leaders, if they want their government to survive. Pro-settlement Bennett, for example, doesn't believe in an independent Palestinian state, unlike some of his partners. Whether they can avoid those issues, though, isn't a given. The majority they hold is not much more than a sliver. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. A Danish soccer player is recovering after that frightening collapse on the pitch this weekend at Euro 2020. The team's doctor says Christian Eriksen suffered cardiac arrest and was revived with a defibrillator. The doctor says Eriksen might not have lived if it hadn't happened at a major soccer tournament with the best medical equipment available. Erickson talked to his team today via video link from his hospital bed. Famed character actor Ned Beatty has died today at the age of 83. He was perhaps best known for his roles in Deliverance, Network and Superman, his long career spanning both screen and stage. His manager says that Beatty died of natural causes surrounded by friends and family. An Alberta man is going public tonight. He had hired a paralegal for his divorce but discovered he was still married and the only thing he had parted with was his money. And it's not an isolated case. Rosa Marcatelli on why hiring a paralegal in many parts of Canada can leave clients with questions unanswered. The legal papers for Aaron Penman's divorce are worthless now. The paralegal he hired a few years ago filled them out wrong and didn't even file them with the court. Instead, Penman says Niasha Muyambo gave him a fake file number so Penman would think the job was done. $1,100 later, the money was gone and Penman was still legally married. And then the excuses, and it got harder to get a hold of, refused to talk to me, and eventually he blocked my phone number. Muyambo didn't answer any of Go Public's messages either. Nothing. No answer. He's a hard man to get a hold of. And at the business address on his website, the house is cleared out. He's also wanted by police after another client complained he did the same thing to him. So currently, uh, 
Mr. Nyasha Moambo has a warrant for theft, or sorry, fraud under $5,000. Unlike lawyers who are regulated by provincial laws, in many parts of the country, paralegals are not. So there's nowhere to go to find out if a paralegal is trained, insured, or even honest, and nowhere to turn if there's a problem. That has paralegals in some provinces asking to be regulated, worried that the reputation of the entire profession is suffering because of a problem few. Literally anybody can walk out their door at any time and say, oh, I'm a paralegal and I can help you with your legal problem. And these people in the public who are being taken advantage of, they've got no recourse. Some provinces, like Manitoba and Saskatchewan, are looking at regulating. Ontario is the only one that already does. In B.C., paralegals have some oversight working under the supervision of lawyers. But Alberta's government, where Muyambo was last operating, is dead set against new rules. That's disappointing to Penman. Something's got to be done. It's just a license to steal in a way, I guess, yeah. He says he's all but given up trying to get his money back. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Ten years ago this week, the streets of Vancouver erupted. Coming up, lessons from the Stanley Cup riot from those who were on the streets. Plus... The lockdown was so long, I think people realized that it was worth it. The debate over vaccine passports and the view from a country that has already used them successfully. That is coming up next. But first... COVID grounded thousands of planes around the world, but what a difference a year makes. Case in point, a Delta jet was recently prepped for return to service after a long period of storage in the American Southwest. That's when the pilot found this note left by a colleague 435 days ago, a kind of COVID time capsule. It's March 23rd. We have just arrived from Minneapolis. Very chilling to see so much of our fleet in the desert. If you are here to pick up, then light must be at the end of the tunnel. Indeed, thanks to soaring vaccination rates, the North American airline industry is now rebounding as travel returns. This summit was the first gathering of G7 leaders. In fact, the first gathering of pretty much any leaders in almost two years. And that Britain was even able to host the G7 meeting speaks to how far we've come since COVID turned life upside down. But until the world achieves a high level of vaccinations, travel remains a significant risk for most countries. And until it can resume at full scale, many economies will continue to suffer. Many nations, including Canada, are now debating so-called vaccine passports for travelers from abroad and even within the country. Proof of COVID protection allowing free movement without the serious danger of infecting others. But not everyone agrees they'll work or that they're worth it. Terence McKenna examines the case for and against. Back in February, Israel launched its version of a vaccine passport called the Green Pass. Everyone who wanted to get into indoor concerts, sporting events, or even restaurants and gymnasiums had to show proof that they had been vaccinated. That could be a piece of paper or a document on your phone with a barcode that could be verified, but seldom was. There was apparently no evidence of forgery. Jerusalem's former deputy mayor and Knesset member Rachel Azaria says there was some skepticism at the beginning, but people quickly accepted the system. We've had COVID for so long. The lockdown was so long that, you know, the feeling that you can go back to life is just, it's just, it's unbelievable. I mean, the fact that we, you know, we just went back to what we've always had before. Uh, I think people realized that it was worth it. Unvaccinated restaurant customers were not turned away. They just had to sit outside, sometimes in these custom bubbles to protect from the weather. Children and others unable to get a vaccine could always show proof of a recent negative test instead. The Green Pass, it wasn't to exclude people or, you know, to differentiate between those that got the vaccine and those that didn't. It was used as an incentive to make sure that people go and get the vaccine, and it worked. Now Israel has one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, around 60% of the population with both doses. 
Last week, the country was celebrating Pride Day, and things looked almost back to normal. Canada is considering a similar vaccine plan. What advice would you give? To give people the feeling that they're part of a community and that it's a communal effort. It's not only for yourself. Canada's first tentative step in this direction came with the recent Toronto Maple Leafs playoff game against the Montreal Canadiens. Healthcare workers attending had to be vaccinated to gain entry. The latest public opinion surveys show that Canadians strongly support requiring vaccines to board an aircraft, 79% in favour for international travel. But that support drops considerably when it comes to domestic use of vaccine passports to enter restaurants and other locations, only 55% in favour of that. Vaccine passport supporters, like University of Ottawa epidemiologist Raywak Dionandat, realize they have a hill to climb in convincing Canadians. It's going to make things more difficult in terms of you know, public buy-in and create some more uh, discontentment and divisions in society, without question. But the, the bottom line is, do we want to accelerate a return to normal? This is the way to do so, or one way to do so. Again, Israel has shown us how to do this. Other countries have shown us how to do this as well. Israel is also a society that is comfortable with conscripting everyone into military service. That's something that Canadians would, would probably have different views about. So I think it's a, a different society. Kara Zweibel is the Fundamental Freedoms Program Director of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. We are typically a, a liberal democratic society, and this is a this is a shift to a, a society where you know it's a, a show me your paper society, and we're much better off encouraging people and educating people who are hesitant about being vaccinated, than ostracizing them and socially sorting them in a way that means that they they can't be out and participating in, in social life. So I understand these concerns. I, I share them to a large extent. Like I, I I'm a, a, a non-white immigrant. Like the idea of being stopped and asked for my papers is disconcerting to me. But the difference here is this is temporary and is to grant me access to services and I can get these papers. Right? Getting it is not a hardship. That's the important part. There is also a concern of sharing private health information and how temporary this would be. I do see it as a slippery slope. I think, I think that you know, some people have talked about this idea as a, as a temporary idea, something that we would do until we reach, you know, herd immunity. But there is no magic number here. We haven't been told that, um, no, no one can tell us when we're going to reach that point, if ever. We are trying to incentivize and encourage vaccination. So we're saying things like, if you vaccinate, you can do all of these wonderful things that society has to offer, like attend a sporting event. And if you don't vaccinate, you got to go through a couple of extra steps, like get a negative swab test. So it's a, a slight disincentive that has the um, it has the result of encouraging vaccination, but it doesn't exclude people who haven't been vaccinated. It just requires more of them. Now several Canadian universities, including the University of Toronto, Western University, and Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, have decided to require proof of vaccine for any student who intends to enter residence for the fall term. Fanshawe's Vice President of Student Services, Michel Baudouin. If we don't, if we don't have a vaccine program, then we won't be able to open the common areas. Students will be restricted similar to the way they are now. They will be uh, more confined to rooms. They won't be able to uh, go into lounges or open common spaces. Bruce Springsteen is returning to Broadway with his one-man show in July. Only fully vaccinated people will be allowed in. Torrance rips one in the air, deep left field. New York State has implemented the Excelsior Pass, which will allow vaccinated people to attend large sporting events and movie theaters. Meanwhile, Governor Ron DeSantis has outlawed vaccine passports in Florida, and many red state governors are moving in the same direction. We followed freedom, and that's the reason why Florida's doing better. At the federal level, President Biden will not issue vaccine passports, but will allow private sector businesses to require them. As people start to travel again, perhaps this summer, if everything goes well, um, it would make sense for us to align with partners around the world on uh, some sort of proof of vaccination or vaccine certification. 
In Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau seems in favor of vaccine proof for international travel, but not for domestic use. While his chief science advisor, Mona Nemer, totally supports the idea. The provinces are split. There is no mandatory vaccines and no vaccine passports in Alberta, and nor will there be a period full stop. Alberta's Jason Kenney is totally against, along with Bonnie Henry and the BC government, while Nova Scotia's Premier Ian Rankin and the Quebec government are all for it. I don't see why we could not have, as I mentioned earlier, what we call the QR code. Vaccine passports are almost certain to appear in Canada for international travel, but it is anyone's guess how extensive will be their domestic use. Meanwhile, back in Israel, the Green Pass system was suspended on June 1st. With daily case numbers in the teens, it is no longer required there. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, we'll go outside the CBC Vancouver building, the scene where 10 years ago this week, a dark moment in this city's history was captured on hundreds of cell phone cameras. I call it the world's first smartphone ride because everybody had that camera, video camera in their pockets. Up next, looking back at the city's second Stanley Cup riot with those who were on the streets that night. Plus, probably the most famous image captured in that riot. We'll hear from the kissing couple 10 years on. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, as much of Canada begins easing pandemic restrictions, we look into the Delta variant, a COVID strain that's concerning epidemiologists and popping up all over the country. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The scene just outside our CBC Vancouver studios 10 years ago this week. For the second time in 17 years, the Canucks lost in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. And for the second time, downtown was engulfed in a riot. It is just after 8.30. The game ended about an hour ago. And this is the scene on Georgia Street, about three blocks away from Rogers Arena. Ten years later, the block looks a lot different. This evening, we're going to talk to three people who are on the streets during the riot. And let's begin with our exclusive interview with the police chief at the time, Jim Chu. In 1994, Chu was a sergeant at the corner of Robson and Thurlow Streets where that riot began. In 2011, he was the chief and again near the flashpoint. I was about four blocks up the street at the edge of the crowd. But while police were once again overwhelmed by drunk, violent crowds, this time there was a big difference in bringing rioters to justice cell phones. It had a huge influence in our success. I call it the world's first smartphone ride because everybody had that camera, video camera in their pockets. Um, you know, I saw different pictures where a, a guy was throwing a uh, makeshift Molotov cocktail and you had 11 people taking his picture. In 1994 we had 100 hours of grainy VHS footage and uh, in 2011 we had over 5,500 hours of uh, high quality video. So you can stop it, you can zero and face it, you can enlarge it, plus 30,000 photographs. And uh, so our ability to track down the riders after was enhanced by all the citizens that were out there taking footage. You know, the big question a lot of people have, if, if the Canucks make it to the Stanley Cup final again and lose, what are the chances we'll go through this again? If you asked me that question in 2012, after we had massive amounts of publicity where we uh, uh, identified riders, where we had public campaigns, where riders' pictures were shown through the news media, through posters. I would have said unlikely because the message got out that uh, if you riot in today's day and age, you'll be caught. But then after watching the Washington DC riots, where again, everybody had cameras and news footage and uh, surveillance video, and people just rioted anyways. It's hard to explain what happens when people get into uh, a crowd mentality. And some of these riders told us uh, I got caught up in the moment. One of the reasons I want to talk about this still is uh, there's whole, a whole new generation of young people across Canada who maybe were five, six years old when the Vancouver ride occurred. Now it's, they're 17, 18 years old. They should remember that uh, with so much footage out there and so many uh, cameras, you're going to get caught. And with social media now, your life's going to be ruined. Uh, I was actually Googling a young offender uh, today because I wanted to know if his name was still on social media, and it was. 
Now, obviously, the uh, news media and the criminal justice system are not allowed to publish his name, but with the internet now, it's there forever. So more than 30,000 pictures from riot night, but Jim Chu says that when he talked to some U.S. police chiefs afterwards, they asked about one photo, the kissing couple. So we tracked them down to ask them about that night and what came next. In the chaos and confusion, this amateur video captured an anonymous couple falling to the pavement and police aggressively trying to get them off the road. But from street level, through the lens of professional photographer Richard Lamb, a single frame made the moment seem romantic. And it's a romance that has endured. Ten years later, the kissing couple is married. They have a young child. Canadian Alex Thomas and Australian Scott Jones now live in Fremantle, near Perth, far from home and far from the frenzy of the first few hours after the picture was published in papers around the world. I guess we didn't really know much about going viral. It's not something that had ever crossed our minds or even a phrase that, you know, now it's so commonplace, but I don't think either of us really had even heard that phrase at that point. Or the ugly side of going viral. False rumors the picture was staged. The Jones, who did some stand-up, was seeking publicity. I'm not very good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't be like we can have an, an international audience. superstar now. I'm not going to be booking my own one-hour gigs. Like, I did a five-minute piece at an open mic night. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a comedian. <laughs> To try to set the record straight, they chose to do one Canadian interview 10 years ago with us on The National. I was upset and I fell down and didn't really know, you know, exactly what was happening. I was upset. She was a bit hysterical afterwards, obviously, um, and I was just trying to calm her down. These days, Scott is pursuing his passion, not comedy, but craft beer. Alex works for the local water utility. And yes, they have the picture up on the wall of their pub, but a decade and half a world away, the fame has subsided. <laughs> you, know, you show people the photo, like I pointed out every now and then to people um, at the bar, and some people remember the photo, other people have no idea. You know, it'll come up at work if somebody new starts, inevitably someone will bring it up a couple weeks in and go, hey, funny story, just so we can have a laugh about it. But other than that, it's not, it's not something you can really just bring up in conversation unless the topic turns to ice hockey, which in Australia it doesn't very often. <laughs> did you notice that Alex said ice hockey? Scott instantly did and said it is a sign that uh, she spent 10 years in Australia after leaving Canada. Friends of an Ottawa couple have been receiving new vacation photos throughout the last year. No, they haven't actually been wandering the world. They just found a way to bring the world to them. Tonight's moment is next. Ottawa couple Ruth and OJ Gallant love to travel. And while things are starting to open up now, the pandemic definitely cramped their style over the last year. So they got creative. Even in the middle of a lockdown, the Gallants found a way to celebrate some beloved destinations and their elaborate staycation photo shoots are tonight's moment. Hi, I'm Ruth. Hi, I'm OJ. And we went on vacation to Florida. Las Vegas. The Maritimes. Hawaii. And New York City. All, all in, in our, our house. house. The Florida Beach one was my favorite. I, I actually, we kept it up. <laughs> we kept it up for a couple of days without taking the scene down. It was great to get up every morning, walk into my living room, sit down in a beach chair and run my toes and my feet through the sand and close my eyes and just pretend I was on a beach in Florida somewhere. We also did a food drink theme to go with the vacation. So we looked up what drinks were applicable to the vacation we were doing. I've always had the live life to the fullest now attitude, but even more so since the pandemic because nothing is a certainty. It brought our friends and fa family some, you know, some laughs and that uh, I just thought it was a nice, nice thing to share with people. It's a lot cheaper than a real vacation. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so obviously they are a fun couple, they're a creative couple. I don't know that I'd really want to have sand in my living room, even if it's supposed to replicate a beautiful beach. I think I'd be too tense. And by the way, our producer Matt said their pictures from Vegas were just maybe a little too risque to show. So I guess what happens in your Vegas living room stays in your Vegas living room. 
That's the National for June 13th. Good night.